from the lesson appointed for the Monday of Holy Week from the book of the prophet Isaiah. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. One of the things that I enjoy doing, one of the things I greatly enjoy doing whenever I'm visiting someone, is to look at all of the family pictures that hang proudly on their walls. Children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, nieces and nephews, goddaughters and godsons. But what I most like to see are the pictures of parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, especially the really old pictures. Pictures that give us a glimpse, a small glimpse, a small picture of an earlier place and an earlier time. And I enjoy the chance to talk to people about the people in those pictures. To try to get to know them just a little through the memories and stories that are passed down one generation to another. And one of the things that amazes me over and over again is the way in which personality and habits get passed along just as easily as the way we look. In so many ways, we don't just inherit the color of our eyes or the size of our nose or the shape of our face. In so many ways, we inherit the thousand and one different things that go into making us who we are, the small quirks and foibles, the habits and customs that set us apart from others, that are part of the unique set of ingredients that produce the people that we are. Maybe these kinds of personality traits aren't properly speaking genetic, but they're nonetheless part of our inheritance. So when I hear those stories and when I look at those pictures, I can begin to see the connections, both physical and personal, and I begin to get a picture of all the forces that went into making the person that I'm speaking to who they are. In a way, I understand a little better who they are and where they've come from. There is, as you likely know, an old tradition of taking the time during the days of Holy Week to read through the four passion narratives, that is, those portions of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John that describe the arrest and trial and crucifixion and death of our Savior Christ, the four accounts of his suffering, of his passion. And this process of reading through the various accounts is intended to open windows into a story that never loses power with frequent telling. We hear these passion narratives each day. And as we walk these days of Holy Week, we discover a whole series of characters who, in so many ways, are very much like us. For me, it's a bit like opening an old family album with pictures of our great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers and our great-aunts and uncles, of long-gone second and third and fourth cousins, twice and three times and four times removed. And even though we may never have met or known any of these people personally, we can instantly see something of ourselves in them. Looking at those old pictures can sometimes feel like looking into a mirror, and we can begin to see ourselves in their faces and maybe recognize ourselves in their stories. To hear the passion narratives from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is to be introduced all over again to our spiritual family, our spiritual mothers and fathers. In more ways than we can imagine, they're our ancestors, both in failings and in faith. And to hear their story becomes an entry point into knowing better our own stories, both good and bad. They serve as a mirror into our own lives. And getting to know their stories better helps us to better understand our own stories. In Mark's account of the Passion, we are introduced to two very different characters, who seem in so many ways to be polar opposites. The first is a woman, unnamed by Mark, as are so many women in Holy Scripture, but whose name is Mary, as John tells us in his account, Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who comes to Jesus with a gift of great value, a carefully crafted alabaster flask, valuable in its own right, but all the more valuable for the yontment, the myrrh which it contains, altogether worth maybe as much as one might earn by labor in a full year. An immense value, the kind of thing that a family might have saved up years and years and years to be used at the time of burial, as much as people might now save the funds over much time to pay all the costs of a funeral, which she then pours out on Jesus, by instinct, by faith, somehow sensing that something of immense significance is about to happen, anointing him in a way which draws together so many different images, the anointing of the Kohen Gadal, 
the high priest to act as the mediator between God and his people, the anointing of the shepherd boy David to be king of Israel by the prophet Samuel, and the mysterious gifts of the Magi to the young boy Jesus. The second character in this story is Judas. Confused, mistaken, deeply convicted Judas. A character so tragic as we might imagine, and in so many ways more real than we like to think. Who sells not Jesus as we like to think for 30 pieces of silver, but who in fact sells himself and his integrity for a fraction, a small amount in comparison to what Mary was willing to spend in love. And perhaps the contrast between Mary's great love and Judas's cheap betrayal speaks to your heart as much as it speaks to mine. Perhaps it speaks to the contradictions that so often rest in each one of us. Those moments of generous love, of compassion or mercy or kindness, and those moments of self-centered love, when we get so caught up in our own affairs that we fail to acknowledge the damage that we do to others. Like so many of the characters that we'll find in this week's hearing of the Passion Narratives, Mary and Judas are our ancestors in failings in faith. In a way, they look like us, or they sound like us, and even act as we do. So I invite you this week to put yourself into this story, because at heart, this is not just a story about people who lived a long time ago. This is a story about you and me right now. It's our story as much as it is their story. And I invite you this Holy Week to see where you stand within the narrative, because just as Christ died and rose again to offer salvation to them, so Christ died and rose again to offer salvation to us. And if we better understand what Christ forgives in our story, we'll better live the risen life which, we, which he calls us to live, the risen life of compassion and mercy and hope. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who of thy tender love towards mankind has sent thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh, and to suffer death upon the cross, that all mankind should follow the example of his great humility. Mercy grant that we may both follow the example of his patience, and also be made partakers of his resurrection, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.